Hi, and welcome to the Vintage Computer Federation YouTube channel. Your support helps us with creating videos just like this one and restoring vintage computers for all the world to enjoy. So please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today. I hope you are too. Uh, my name is Mike McGann. And today I want to talk about my adventures in emulation. So where does this adventure start? So I got a friend of mine, his name is Eric Chomkill. He loves to collect old vintage computer equipment. He has so much of this equipment, he doesn't even know where to store it all. So every now and then, a group of three of us get together. That would be Eric Chomko, me, and David Gent, who is in the audience today. Everybody give a quick round of applause for David Gent. He drove all the way down from Seattle to be here today. So. so every now and then we get together for what we call the Vintage Computer Club. That's basically us sitting around for a day, drinking a couple beers, and working on some of this equipment, and trying to get it to work. So this is us working on a compact, portable computer. I'm sure many of you out here are familiar with this computer. In the event that you're not, let me tell you how portable it is. It is 31.4 pounds of portable computing power. I weighed it. So every time I go over to Eric's house, his wife is always trying to take me, she's always trying to get me to take some of this old computer equipment home with me to help declutter her house. So I decided to take up on that offer, and I bought this Commodore 128 from Eric. Uh, this is a computer I spent a lot of time on when I was a kid, learning how to write code and also play some games as well. Now I apologize if I just called you old out there by saying I used this computer when I was a kid, but this is the Vintage Computer Festival, and like it or not, none of us here are getting any younger. So, uh, since then, my wife went down to her father's house, uh, Larry Sawyer, and told him that he had to declutter his house, and that's how I ended up with this Commodore 128D. This is now how I have it set up at home right now on this desk. Let me tell you, it's been really great playing with these old computers again. I've been having a great time. But it sort of got me thinking. I'm actually a programmer by trade. Um, and I'm always looking for a little side project to do, um, just for things to do for fun. So it sort of got me thinking, you know, it'd be kind of fun to write an emulator from scratch to see what I could do. Now, I don't want to do something that's 100% complete. That's too much work. I don't want to do anything that's 100% accurate. I just want to be able to start and get to the point where I can type in a basic Hello World program. So I decided to do that for the Commodore 64, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So when it comes to writing an emulator, uh, the first thing that you need is to get a hold of the ROMs for the computer. So we're talking about the Commodore 64, there are three ROMs that we are concerned with. Uh, the first one's called the kernel, and that basically provides the rudimentary operating system for the computer. Note that the word kernel is spelled wrong. A uh, legend has it that one of the original engineers spelled kernel wrong in the documentation, spelled it wrong consistently in the entire documentation, never thought that's how you were supposed to spell it. So you know you're reading legitimate Commodore documentation when kernel is spelled wrong. So this is, as I know it, it's urban legend, maybe it's not true. Uh, the next one is the ROM for the basic interpreter. And then we also need the character generator ROM. And this provides basically the um, pixel representations for the uh, text graphics that are displayed on the screen. So to get a hold of these ROMs, you know, I basically just downloaded and installed the Vice emulator. Well, let's be serious, I already actually had it installed. I just went through the folders looking for the kernel, basic, and charge end ROMs and just copied it over to my emulator. So talking about ROMs, uh, the next thing to talk about is memory. So on these 8-bit machines here, we actually have an eight-line data bus, also a 16-line address bus. Uh, and with that, you can actually access up to two to the 16 different 8-bit values. And that is 65,536, also known as 64K. So you may want to, you know, when you start thinking about this, you may think, you know, let's model memory as a simple array, just a huge array of 8-bit values. Uh, that's 64K in length. Now the problem with this, it actually doesn't model how the CPU interacts with the buses in general. So while most of the time, the 6502 CPU uses the buses to talk to memory, whether that be RAM chips 
or ROM chips. You can also use those buses to communicate with a sound chip or the video chip or even the user port on the back of the machine. So what you could actually do with the Commodore is take one of those lines on the user port, hook it up to a relay, hook up that relay to your desk lamp, you could actually tweak a value in memory to turn the lamp on and off. Would I recommend doing this? Absolutely not. It is very easy to fry your computer doing this. Now, if you're an expert, go ahead, feel free. I am not an expert. I've destroyed at least three things in the past two years. So um, if you really want to turn your desk lamp on and off, just buy an Arduino. They're $6. They still make them. Um, if you blow that one up, you can always buy another one. But there is a chip shortage. I'm not sure if you can even get one. Maybe they're $60 now. I'm not sure. So. Okay, so the Commodore 64 is called the 64 because it actually comes with 64K of memory. Now, as we are talking about before, the entire address space is 64K. So all those ROMs we got from the other emulator, where do they actually go in memory? So a common technique used back then is to map these into the address space as needed. So here's a configuration here. We actually have the basic ROM mapped in at address 8000. We have the character generator ROM mapped in at D1000. And then we have the kernel mapped in at E1000. And anywhere else that we don't have a ROM mapped into, you can actually access the RAM that's located there. The great thing about this is that you can actually change this dynamically at runtime. And let's say you're developing a program that's in pure machine language, and you don't need the basic interpreter. You can actually pick a memory configuration where that's banked out, and then you actually have access to more RAM at that point. So what we don't need is an array of 8-bit values, but what we really want in this point is actually an array of mappings to 8-bit values. And then this way we can actually dynamically change what each address points to at runtime. Now it took me about three iterations to actually get this correct. I knew at the very beginning it was not going to be an array. So I did basic mappings at a page-based level, and it actually worked okay for the commoner, uh, but I ran into problems later with that approach. I then changed it to be mappings where they were pointers to values, and it actually worked out for a while, but then I ended up settling on each one being a function instead, as that gives you the more, most flexibility in handling that. So if you go to um, c64wiki.com, there's an actual great table there. Um, so on the Commodore 64, memory is configured by five separate latches. Uh, two of them are controlled by whatever, whatever happens to be plugged into the expansion port. Uh, and the other three can be influenced by the programmer at runtime. So with those five latches, you get 32 different combinations. Uh, not all of them are unique. Um, and so this table actually maps it out quite well. And I basically just followed this and got a working memory implementation. With that done, it's now time to move on to the heart of every computer, which is the CPU. This is a photo from inside my Commodore 128. Uh, the 128 actually has two CPUs. We'll be first talking about the one on the left. Here it is, the MOS Technologies 8502, which is a variant of the 6502. And in order to learn how to emulate a CPU, you have to learn how to speak the language of the CPU. So I read this book, Machine Language for the Commodore 64, 128, and other Commodore computers, uh, written by Jim Butterfield. This is actually a really good book. And I actually still have this book. It has survived with me until today. Now, if you want to read this book and you don't happen to have a copy, don't worry. Uh, somebody has scanned in the entire contents, uploaded it as a PDF, and it's available for download at the Internet Archive. Let me tell you, the Internet Archive is a great resource. So here's an example of an instruction that we want to emulate. This is the instruction to store the contents of the X register to memory location 381. So on the 6502, each instruction can be anywhere between one, two, and three bytes in length. Uh, this one is three bytes, and this is how it's stored in memory. The first byte is the opcode that represents this instruction. In this case, it is 8E. That is then followed by the memory address. Uh, the bytes here are 8103. Uh, the bytes are swapped because it's a little Endian architecture. And if you notice, this is actually the same instruction featured on the cover of the Butterfield book. The zero character is saying STX381, and the one character is showing you how that's in memory, 
as 8E8103. Now, how cute is that? Whoever came up with that, that was a great idea. So, when we're ready to start with our CPU um, emulation, we want to start with our basic run loop. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. So there's going to be an infinite loop at the top of each loop. We're going to actually fetch the next opcode that we want to execute. Uh, we find that by looking in the program counter. It actually has a memory location of where that is located in memory. Uh, this is a two or three byte instruction. We then want to load that and then possibly load an argument from either memory or from a CPU register. We then want to execute that instruction. At that point, depending on the result of the operation, we may want to adjust flags in the CPU. And then that result may be saved back to either a CPU register or to memory. So here's a quick implementation. We're not gonna go into detail about this, but this is the implementation for logical AND. Uh, the great thing about writing an emulator is that your programming language of choice typically has a lot of these operations already built in. So in this case here, writing the implementation for AND only took four lines of code. Now, not all of them are gonna be four lines of code. Uh, some are gonna be harder, some are gonna be longer. Uh, some are actually gonna be simpler as well. Uh, but they tend to sort of average out to about this kind of complexity here. Now, there's more than just one AND instruction. There actually happens to be eight separate AND instructions. Uh, and these are those eight different instructions here. And these only differ about how they get their one argument, okay? So like the first one is the immediate form of AND, and it actually gets that from memory at the location that immediately follows the opcode. Then we'll have other addressing modes as well. They basically pull it from memory, which could be indexed, and also indirect versions as well. And these are the additional dressing modes for this instruction. Now you may think, do you actually have to write eight separate implementations for AND to handle all these? And actually, no, you don't have to. The way I did it was basically you write one function for each addressing mode, you write one function for each instruction, and then you apply a mapping of those in a table. So my 6502 implementation, I wrote mine in the Go programming language. Has anybody here used Go? Okay, who liked Go? Who likes Go? Nobody likes Go? Okay, we got somebody back there. We got a brave soul back there. Some other people do too. Uh, so this is actually a fun language to work with. Um, the 6502 um, has 151 opcodes that need to be implemented, uh, but you don't actually have to write a separate function for each one of those. So I did it in 37 different functions. Uh, 11 of those were actually so trivial that it could be done in one line of code. So my final implementation ended up being 599 lines of code. So if you think writing an emulator for the 6502 is a huge undertaking, it actually isn't all that bad. Now I did write 2,828 lines of test code. Uh, the reason for that is A, I wasn't necessarily efficient. I did a lot of copying and pasting. Don't tell anybody that. And then two, with this kind of stuff, you want to do as much upfront testing as possible. Because bugs you find now, a lot easier to fix than bugs you find later. Because once you start running the kernel through your emulator and something goes wrong, it's gonna be very difficult to find out why. So I use this resource here from 6502.org. Uh, this was originally written by John Pickens and up later, updated later by Bruce Clark and Ed Spittles. And this basically just has every instruction supported by the 6502 uh, in a nice tabular format by addressing mode. And it tells you all the flags that are affected by each operation and some notes to go along with this. So I use base, this basically as my primary source to actually do the emulator itself. So once you have all the instructions implemented and ready to go, it's actually time to do a little bit of tooling. So first thing I needed was basically a memory inspector. As we start running things through the emulator, we wanna be able to look in memory to see how those contents change over time. And of course, something is gonna go wrong. There is absolutely no way you're gonna get it right the first time. Uh, when that does happen, we wanna be able to trace the execution of the CPU to see what it's doing. And hopefully, that'll give us an indication as to what the problem is. 
in order to trace the execution of the CPU, but we also need a disassembler. And then we can take these three tools and bundle them up into a nice runtime monitor. Um, it's not required, uh, but it is kind of fun to do that depending on your definition of fun. Uh, for me, it actually was quite fun. I spent way too much time on this. So now we're ready to power on the emulator for the first time and see what we got. There's a couple last minute details we gotta take care of. Uh, we actually have to load the ROMs in at this point and map them into memory appropriately. Uh, when the computer starts, there is a reset line on the 6502. When that's asserted, the program counter is loaded with the contents located at FFFC. That is the reset vector. Now we haven't done video yet, but what we can do is actually look at the contents of video memory that's at memory location 400. And then we can actually look to see if we can see the classic Commodore startup banner there. So I turned it on for the first time, looked at memory, and this is what we got. So it looks like a whole bunch of nothing. Well, actually it's a little bit of something. If you actually take a look, those are all hex 20s. Uh, 20 is the character for space. If we had nothing, they'd all be zeros. So it looks like it at least got up and cleared the screen but didn't make it any further than that. What happened? I don't know. So this is when you turn on um, some debugging tools and we will tr now start tracing the CPU execution to see what's going on. And then when I did that, this is what we get. Now what's happening here is that the CPU is checking for a value located at D012 and then it's branching back on itself if that's not equal to zero. So for some reason, it's waiting for the value at D012 to become zero. Why? I don't know. Um, I'm not a Commodore expert, but do you know who is a Commodore expert? Uh, Sheldon Lehman, he wrote this book, Mapping the Commodore 64. Uh, this book is great, it actually details every single memory address location and tell you what it's used for. Now, unfortunately, I don't actually have a copy of this book, uh, but guess what? Somebody actually scanned in the entire contents, uploaded it as a PDF, and it's available for downloading at the Internet Archive. The Internet Archive is a great resource. So I downloaded this book, turned to the page that talks about D012. And what this is, it actually holds the contents of a video chip register that tells you what the current scan line is. So you know, on these old school CRTs, you know, for each frame, it actually the electron gun goes and scans to paint the picture of what the current frame is. Uh, this value is actually which line it's on. Now, of course, we haven't done anything with video yet, so if you're expecting it to be zero and it's not zero, that's never gonna happen. So why is it waiting for it to be zero? I don't know. Uh, I suspect that it's actually waiting for the video chip to initialize. And it's doing that by waiting for the value to become zero for the very first time. So what do you do in this case? Here, I don't know either. Um, so, you know, it wants zero, so we'll give it what it wants. So at the beginning of the run loop, every single time, I wrote the location of D012 with zero. Will that work? Who knows? Is it correct? Absolutely not. Uh, but the fun thing about writing an emulator is trying these things out. You're gonna run into these kind of problems. You're not gonna know what the correct solution is. So we're gonna hack it for now and see what happens. You can always change it later if it's wrong. So I hacked that in, and we actually got a little bit further. We actually do have a startup banner at this point. If you look closely, there's actually a small problem with this. It says that our 64K RAM system has zero basic bytes free. Now we have definitely more than zero, so there must be something wrong with my implementation. I suspect it's subtraction that is taking the total amount of space minus what's used and coming up with this value. And my subtraction is wrong. So I went and looked at the code. I couldn't find anything wrong there. I checked a couple other instructions. They looked fine too. So all those tests that I wrote earlier, uh, it wasn't enough to catch this bug. So you can write a lot of tests. Doesn't mean you're gonna catch them all. So what do you do in this case? I went out and find, found somebody else who wrote tests and used those instead. So this is actually a repository. Uh, this is written by Klaus Dorman. This is a test written in 6502 assembly that's meant to be run on an actual CPU. And the way this test works is that you run it, and eventually the CPU will get trapped at a certain memory location. One location means that the test was successful. 
everything is correct. If it gets trapped elsewhere, that means your test failed, and where it got trapped will give you an indication of what was wrong. It won't be specific, but at least give you an idea. So I ran this through my emulator, and sure enough, I found a problem. I found a problem with, with subtraction. So I did some more research on that, and I realized that in a certain case, I actually set one of the flags wrong. Hold on. Here we go. Okay, so after I fixed that, fire it up again, now we actually have the correct value. So now that we actually have text appearing in the video memory, let's go ahead and work on video. So for this, I use the stand, uh, simple direct media library, uh, version two. Uh, this is actually really easy to work with. Uh, it gives you support for graphics, audio. Um, you get it working on Mac, it should work on Windows, it should work on Linux. So when we're working on our video, there's a couple memory locations that we're concerned about. We've already talked about 400. That is where the contents of text memory is located. We also want the color of those characters as well. That's found at D800. We got the color of the border as stored at D020. And then we have the background color stored at D021. Uh, now it's time to use the chargen ROM. Uh, like I said before, this actually has the pixel representations of all the text characters. So what we want to do is take the contents of that ROM and create a tile sheet of all the possible characters that can be displayed on the screen. When we do that, this is what we get. Uh, this is the beautiful Petsky text set here. There's actually four different sets here. The first one is uppercase characters and additional symbols. That's then repeated. Then we have uppercase and lowercase. Then that's repeated. Uh, now we gotta talk about some colors. Uh, the Commodore 64 supported 16 different colors. These are those 16 colors. Let me tell you something, if I told my wife these were the only 16 colors she could use to decorate our house, she would think I was crazy. So I'm not sure how these colors came to be. Um, I'm assuming there's uh, some good reasons for some of these colors, or maybe engineers picked it. Don't let engineers pick colors. Uh, but they sold a lot of units, so they did pick, do something right. Uh, then what we need is a, another surface to actually render our frame that we're gonna display as our video display. And this is actually pretty simple. So every frame, you basically just have to clear out the entire image with the background color, draw your border, it's only four rectangles, and then for each column and row, find out which character is supposed to be there, and basically copy that image from the tile sheet over into the display surface. We get that up and running. Now we actually have our display working at this point. But we don't actually have a blinking cursor yet because we haven't done interrupts. So 60 times every second, uh, the CPU is interrupted to do certain tasks such as blinking the cursor, reading the status of the keyboard, uh, and other administrative tasks. When that happens, um, the interrupt sequence is started. If the CPU is currently executing an instruction, it finishes that first, then pushes the contents of the program counter and the status register to the stack. It sets the interrupt disable flag so it doesn't get interrupted while servicing the interrupt. It then transfers control uh, to the program that is the interrupt service routine. And that memory location is stored at FFFE, which is the inter interrupt request vector. And that continues until a return from interrupt instruction. When that happens, the sequence is done in reverse and control is returned to the original program. Last thing we gotta take care about is the keyboard. So at this point, I decided to cheat a little bit. I didn't really wanna do a full keyboard implementation at this point. Uh, but what I did know is that at memory location 277, there's actually a keyboard buffer. This is a ring buffer that is 10 bytes in length. <clears throat> this contains what was been recently pressed. There's an index into that buffer at C6, and then the status of the stop key is located at 91. So what I did is knowing this, I decided to do the work of the kernel myself. So as I was reading SDL keyboard events, uh, when a Mac key or a PC key gets pressed, I map that to a Commodore key and then stuff this into the buffer directly. So is this gonna work? I don't know, but you know what? If there's a chance to take a shortcut, why not? Because this can actually save a lot of time programming. 
The worst case scenario, if it doesn't work, you just have to do the real implementation. So you find ways to actually be able to, you know, take some shortcuts. There's nothing wrong with doing that. So I did that and actually it did work, which was great. So I got this up and running. Um, I can actually type in a simple basic program. Um, I will have to admit, I had to actually look up how to write this program. It's been so long since I've done basics, so. Uh, but my goal is to get up to being able to say hello world, and that's what I got up to. So, so what now? You know, I don't have, I don't have bitmap graphics yet. I don't have sprites, I don't have audio. The sky's the limit at this point. So I spent the next 450 hours, yes, 450 hours playing the game Factorio. <laughs> so, this is, this is a great game, I must say. So 450 hours gets you that. Sometimes it's a curse that Steam tells you how long you've been playing for. So the first time I gave this presentation, uh, some of the audience asked me, they said, well, how did you find so much time to write an emulator? I'm thinking, I just told you I spent 450 hours on this. I was like, you know, if that's a full-time job, that's like, that's like three months. So I was more concerned about that. So as you can tell at this point, I sort of took a little bit of a break. Um, at the time, I was working at a job down in Greenbelt, Maryland, and I would go to this place for lunch, Three Brothers Restaurant, get myself two slices of pizza, a drink, and then go play Ms. Pac-Man. So in the back, they actually have a 25th anniversary edition, Ms. Pac-Man and Galaga. Um, so I started playing this, and I realized, wait a second, I got a working Commodore 64. How much more work would it be to do something like Pac-Man? So I started Googling how to write a Pac-Man emulator, and this document pops up. The Pac-Man emulation guide, version 0.1, October 2008, written by Chris Lamont. Like, this is great. This is an eight to, page, eight, to, eight to 10 page document of everything you need to know to write a Pac-Man emulator. I was like, okay, with this, I can actually do it. Now, when I was actually preparing for this presentation, I went back to visit this website and I got a 404 error. So I went to his main page and there he said, at the request of Namco, he has redacted all information on his Pac-Man emulation pages that contain their material, his first cease and desist letter. So this is where everybody in the audience boos. There we go, okay. Exactly, exactly. So, this is an important lesson that if you find something of value on the internet and you want it to be there later on for reference, it may not be. It could be there today, it could be gone tomorrow. If it's that important to you, make sure you make a copy of it. And I did, and I still have that copy. So this is where everybody cheers. Okay. So if anybody wants to copy this, hit me up later and I can hook you up. You know, this is like, you know, contraband or something, so. <laughs> Okay, so we'll first go back and talk about memory. So the Commodore 64, you know, had 64K of memory, but Pac-Man doesn't need that. So all the ROMs are located in the low part of memory. Uh, we have a small little slice of RAM at 4,000. Uh, basically, the I.O. registers are mapped in at 5,000, and then 6,000 above, it's unmapped. There's absolutely nothing there. One thing to note with um, Pac-Man is that there's actually asymmetric access to certain memory addresses. Uh, this example, we're gonna talk about memory location 5004. If you read from that memory location, it'll tell you, this, tell you the status of the joystick, whether it's being pressed up, down, left, or right, and it'll tell you if a coin's being inserted into the machine. Now, if you actually try to write to that memory location, you can actually turn the player one start lamp on or off. So this is what I got wrong in my initial implementation. I didn't know you could actually do this. So what you read from could be completely different than what you write to. So I end up having two arrays, one for readers and one for writers. Another thing is, while the joystick can be read at memory location 5004, it can also be read at 5000, 5001, 5002, all the way up to 5003F. And the reason for this is that there may be 16 address lines, but it's not listening to all 16. So it's only doing a partial decoding of the address. So one location may be mapped to multiple addresses as well. So Pac-Man comes in a whole bunch of ROMs. Uh, the code itself is distributed across four ROMs. They're each 4K in length. We also have a ROM for the tiles, one for the sprites, 
one for the colors, one for the palettes, and then two for the waveforms that give us that funky Pac-Man sound. <clears throat> now, I am not gonna tell you where you should go download illegal ROMs from the internet, because I know you don't have a license for these, so you should not be downloading them. But let me tell you something. The Internet Archive is a great resource. They have the entire main collection here. We can download all the games it supports, either individually or as a torrent, and get the whole collection. This is how I got my, well, I got some ROMs somewhere, so this might be the place. Notice it says six reviews here. I'm not sure why you need six reviews. You just need one. This is amazing. I'm assuming the other five reviews are just unread cease and desist letters, so. Uh, time to move, move on to the CPU. Um, so this is back at the Commodore. Like I said before, it actually has two CPUs. We're not gonna be talking about the one on the right, which is the Zilog Z80. This is actually the CPU that is used in Pac-Man. So my implementation for this um, was a little bit longer. Uh, the Z80 actually has 1,596 opcodes, which is about 10 times more than the 6502. I wrote that in 71 different functions that ended up being 1,851 lines of code. Now notice I don't have how many test lines of code I wrote, because I didn't write any tests. I was like, you know what, I've done a lot of testing already. I'm tired of writing tests. Let's see if somebody else has written tests. I'll use that instead. So I did some research, and I came across the Fuse emulator, uh, which emulates the um, Sinclair uh, ZX Spectrum computer. I actually don't really know anything about this computer. Apparently this is very popular in the UK. I think I've seen this once. Uh, but it actually uses a Z80. And in their source tree, they actually had um, Z80 tests that I could use. The great thing about those tests is they're actually just as simple text files of what the input is and what the output is. So I could easily convert that into a test runner I could use for my code. So one thing to note about that kind of stuff, you know, reuse, you know, everybody wants to talk about how easy it is to reuse code. And people try to talk about things like libraries, frameworks, all that kind of stuff. No, this was a simple text document, okay? So reuse is all about using the work of others to solve your problems, and not like the failed promises of object-oriented programming and stuff like that, so. I'm glad I got some laughs on that one. I wasn't sure about that one, but that's, that's glad to, I'm glad to see that, so. Um, at some point, you're gonna build an opcode table, and this is basically, a table that maps every single opcode to the instruction you want to execute. So I built this by hand for the 6502. Uh, for 151 instructions, it wasn't that bad, but now we're talking about 1,500, and that's a lot to do. I was like, is there any way I can automate this? Well, you go searching on the internet, you can find anything. So at Z80info, uh, there's actually a web page here written by Christian Denu that gives you an algorithm of how to convert the opcode into the instruction that needs to be executed. So at this point, I wrote some code to then write the code to write the opcode table. So when you get to the point where you're writing code to write code, I'm not sure if that is the ultimate expression of programming or if that's just utter laziness. It's probably a combination of both. Okay, so now we're moving on to doing our tile sheets again. Uh, this is the text characters for Pac-Man. Uh, it includes more than just text and numbers. It actually has uh, some of the scores that get displayed. It actually has some of the fruits. And these are actually some of the um, tiles I used to build the boards. Uh, we also have to do sprites as well. Uh, these text characters are eight by eight, sprites are 16 by 16. These are how they look. Uh, these here actually have four different colors that they can be. Uh, these are all just rendered in gray right now, uh, but then they get applied to a palette at runtime. Audio, now I'm actually completely new to audio. I haven't really worked a lot with it. Uh, basically, everything I know about audio, I learned from playing around with the SID chip. Uh, so with the SID chip, there's actually, I think, like four different waveforms that you can choose from. What's good about this is that you can actually load the waveforms into the ROM and play whatever you want. Now, these aren't like high quality waveforms. Uh, each sample can only be one of 16 different values. Uh, each waveform here is only, I think, like, like 32 in width. Uh, and to be honest, I don't even know what some of these are gonna do. Now, for my days of working on the SID chip, I do know that the one in the top left corner is your classic sine wave, and it gives you a nice clear tone through that. I recognize this as being a triangle wave. I recognize this being a sawtooth wave, uh, but these others I actually don't know. 
This one, what's this one? Is that a diamond wave? I, I don't know. Maybe this gives you that waka waka noise. I'm not sure. Um, but basically, you have all these waveforms here. Uh, and for the audio there, it's actually three separate voices. And there's memory locations for each of those three voices. Uh, one memory location will tell you which waveform of those to select. Uh, then we have another memory location for the frequency for that, and then what volume it should be emitted at. And it's actually a pretty straightforward um, conversion to take all this information and then plug it through the SDL audio subsystem. Now, I got this to the point where it was working enough that I recognized what it was trying to do, but it's definitely not correct. So I would say I'm like 90% of the way there. I was gonna finish it at some point, but just never did, so. Okay, it's time to fire up the emulator and see what we got. So we start off with this. Well, that's not Pac-Man, but what this is is actually the service screen. So there's actually a button in the cabinet that you can press and it'll bring up the screen. This allows the operator to change certain parameters, like how much it costs to play the game, uh, how many points you need for a extra life, and some other diagnostic tools as well. So actually, I didn't implement any buttons yet. So that's actually the problem here. So I implemented the button for this, fire it up again. Now this is what we get. This is looking good. This actually looks like what Pac-Man's supposed to be. Get our classic attract mode here. But Pokey's actually the wrong color. Pokey's supposed to be like orange. Pac-Man's supposed to be yellow. The ghosts are completely not the right color there. Okay, so we got a problem with the colors. We can work on fixing that. Let me get to the demo mode here. Um, it blinks four times, nothing happens. Blinks four times, nothing happens. And then for some reason we're in the animation that gets shown after you finished level two. Why? I have no clue. So, so I went back and started looking at the document more. Apparently there's another button called the rack advanced switch. When you press that button, for some reason, it immediately finishes the current level and advances to the next one. Why? I don't know. I'm not sure why that was even put into the machine, but apparently you can do that. So what I suspect is happening here is that I haven't implemented that yet. It gets the demo mode, it's pressed up, it just goes to the next level. So one of these days I wanna find somebody who actually owns an actual Pac-Man and try it out to see if it's true. So I implemented all of the buttons at this point um, to make sure they actually had at least a sane value. So then when I fire it up again, I notice that something is missing here. So this is what I had at the moment, but the correct startup screen looks like this. And what's missing is at the top of the screen, the word high score, and at the lower left-hand part of the screen, the number of credits that you have. Now why would those be missing? Why would just those two be missing, but everything else is working fine? Now I did notice in my monitor that I spent way too much time tooling that um, it was spitting out all these warnings saying it was trying to write two unmapped memory locations. I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. So it actually prints out what values it's trying to write. So I poked those in the memory to see what it was trying to write. And when I did that, it actually is trying to write the word credit. But why is it trying to write the word credit to a location in memory where there's nothing? I was stumped on this for a while. So I resorted to reading the main source code and I came across this interesting comment here. It says, Pac-Man and most bootlegs don't have an A15 line to the CPU. So what that means is that with our CPU, there's actually 16 address lines and the top one never got hooked up. So here's what we saw. It was trying to write the memory location C03B and nothing's there. Now if we convert this to binary, it looks like that. These are our 16 address lines. Notice that the top one is a one, but that's not hooked up. That's always gonna be a zero. We convert that back into hex, we get 403B, and that is where video memory is. What I'm thinking here is that this is probably a copyright protection mechanism. So if you actually try to take a Pac-Man ROM and loaded it into another cabinet, that actually had a working A15 line, you would see those glitches. And no respectable operator would put a arcade machine on location where you can't see how many credits you've inserted, so. So, I decided not to cut the 15 line, I decided to actually double map it up into the higher address space. When I did that, it now shows up. Okay, let's continue where we left off. 
we got the colors working, we got the correct text, things are looking great. We get to demo mode, uh, Pac-Man goes left, eats two dots, and immediately dies. Why? I don't know. So, I guess I still have a bug somewhere I haven't found. You know, at this point, I don't know what it could be. You know, I actually got all those tests from the Fuse emulator, and apparently that wasn't even enough testing. There's still some holes in coverage. So I went looking for more tests at this point, and I found the Z80 instruction exerciser written by Frank Kringle. Uh, this is basically like the other test, where the, you, know, you run this through, and it'll tell you what is wrong. So I ran this through again, and guess what? I had an error with subtraction yet again. So maybe that is why I majored in computer science and not mathematics. So I went looking at subtraction again, and I found the bug, and I fixed it, ran it again, and now we have a working emulator. So thank you, thank you. So the great thing about this is that it takes forever to get up to a working version of Pac-Man. It only takes like 15 minutes to get Ms. Pac-Man to work. Because it's all about just, it's the same hardware, it's just about getting the other ROMs. So we got Pac-Man working, we got Ms. Pac-Man working, you know, everybody's happy, so. Okay, so if I inspired any of you out there to take your own adventure in writing an emulator, I got some tips for you. At the very beginning, you need to collect as much documentation as possible up front, do as much research as you can. You don't want to get halfway through the project and realizing you're missing a critical um, piece of knowledge. You should also evaluate the complexity of what you're trying to do. Some things will be easier than others. So we talked about the 6502. It's got 150 or so opcodes. Uh, Z80's got 10 times that amount. While it may be just as easy to do either one, um, it's a lot harder to get 1500 working correctly. So if you're choosing between the two, you may want to start with the 6502. Uh, requires a lot of patience. It's going to be a lot of puzzle solving. You have to be up for doing that and enjoy doing that. You have to realize that failure is an option. It should be about the journey to get there, not necessarily about arriving at your destination. And smaller projects are fun too. My personal best high score in Ms. Pac-Man is 206,990 points. So this one actually has the fast ROM hack in it, so Ms. Pac-Man goes pretty fast. It's actually pretty easy to get to all, past all the fruit levels. Um, but I spent a solid year of going to lunch every week trying to get above 200,000. And I finally did, and I was so excited. There was a woman there who came up and asked me, she's like, are you the one who wrote the book on Pac-Man? I was like, no. I was like, why do you ask? She's like, I see you here playing this machine all the time. Um, and I heard somebody here wrote the book on Pac-Man. I was like, well, unfortunately, that is not me. I don't think this person exists. I come in the next week, somebody got the high score up to 400,000. I was like, I spent the whole year, and somebody doubled my score in one week. So maybe this person does exist. So anyway, um, I do have this code up on GitHub. It's not well documented by any means. Uh, it's not efficient either. But if you'd like to take a look at it, uh, this is where you can find it. Uh, feel free to um, take a photo of this for later reference. Now, I will try to give a live demo. Uh, does anybody here want to play Pac-Man? Anybody in the audience? Somebody's got to want to play Pac-Man. Come on up. Everybody clap. Um... I did not plug in audio yet. Let's see if this works. Now, the one thing about playing with them, playing around with emulators is that you can modify things. So what we're gonna do here, we're gonna make a little tweak here. We're gonna continue. And instead of the standard copyright message, we're gonna get now is saying, August 7th, 2022, VCF West. So, so it's always fun to be able to change things like that at runtime. Okay, are you ready to play? Ready as I'll ever be. Okay, now I will warn you, uh, there is a bug that if this controller becomes disconnected, this crashes. Okay. So, 
Okay, select the insert a coin. Oh, that was a little loud. Yeah. And like I said, the audio is not correct, so it's going to be a little bit off. Okay, and then start to play. Wow, this is, I'm not used to this. Why isn't it going down? <laughs> <laughs> it's only letting me go sideways. Let me see. I swear it was transport. Oh. <laughs> Why isn't it? Oh, I just have to jam it, I guess. You gotta jam it. <laughs> this thing takes like. Yeah, I didn't bring high quality equipment with me, so. 20 pounds of pressure. <clears throat> this is what we did in the 80s, so. Down, down. <laughs> Patience. Oh no, that's not a good situation. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope you had a good time. Okay, now we'll answer any questions that you may have. Uh, there is a microphone up here, so if you want to ask a question, come on up. I will try to do my best to answer any questions that you may have. Come on up, ask a question. What do you like about Go? What do I like about Go? I tried learning it and I just, it just didn't compute with my brain. I guess, I mean, it was like very hasty for a tiny thing, mm -hmm. but like, I'm, I'm curious, what's the appeal? Okay, what's the appeal? Let's say you wanna write an emulator, okay? What language are you gonna pick? Okay, that's too much work. I don't got time for C. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I actually let go because you sort of have um, a language that is compiled, it is quite fast, and um, it's not necessarily difficult to work with, so. So that's why, and I actually used Go at a job I was at previously, so ah. that helps too, so. Anybody else? No other questions? There's gotta be at least one more question. Just one. Here we go, I like this. Is it Go related? Uh, it is not Go related. Okay. Uh, but thank you for the, the talk. Uh, you know, what, what's next for, for your, your projects and what you're trying to do with emulation? Uh, emulation, I think I'm done. So, I had my fun, I had a good time. Um, but you know, there's lots of great emulators out there. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I just want to learn more about the process, learn more about these old computers, uh, and I achieve that goal. So the current thing I'm working on right now is actually pinball stuff. So I actually have a pinball machine, a Judge Dredd 1993. And you can actually replace the CPU in that with a modern board that speaks USB. And I can use my laptop to control the pinball machine. I'm actually rewriting the code for that um, that's my current project, so. I'm not sure if pinball qualifies as vintage computing, so. So you probably won't see that here. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? It is late in the day, so. Okay, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out today. I hope you had a great time. And if you have questions later, uh, you want to ask me, just go ahead and send me an email. Uh, I'll be more than happy to answer them. So thanks a lot. <laughs>